this webinar sponsored by PG&E and brought to you by TRC, the California Multifamily New Homes Program and California Advanced Homes. Uh, this is a webinar specifically oriented for HERS raters and energy consultants that participate with the program, but uh, I think there will be some stuff that's that is relevant for, for everyone that participates in the program or is interested in learning more. Um, I think we'll just start right away. You can go to the next slide. Great. So uh, as you know, we're all logged into GoToWebinar right now. We'll be using the same process that we use for all of our webinars. So if you have a question, you can put that directly into the question bar on your right side. We'll be pausing at various points during the webinar to address any questions that you have. Um, and I'll say, too, for the purpose of this webinar, we, uh, we want to make it relevant to folks that are experienced with the program and also anyone who hasn't worked with us before. So if I do see a question that's kind of specific to one project or, or a question that I don't think we need to address on the air, um, I'll just flag it and we can touch base afterwards um, and, and have some more time to discuss whatever questions you have. Um, so next slide. Great. And as I mentioned before, uh, both CAPS, California Advanced Homes Program, and CMFNH, uh, California Multifamily New Homes, are sponsored by PG&E. So these programs are for projects, new construction, residential projects in PG&E service territory. Um, CAP also operates statewide with the, uh, some of the other large utilities, SDG&E, uh, SCE, and SoCal Gas. So if you have any projects that are um, being built elsewhere in the state uh, and you don't know who to get in touch with to see about eligibility, um, you, can, uh, you can contact us. And our information, our contact information is on the last slide of this webinar, which we'll be distributing to all of you in the next couple days, um, along with a link to the recording. Um, so, so you'll be able to get in touch with us. Um, Next slide. Great. So the programs have um, a few goals kind of in the big picture, uh, one of which more immediately is to support the California Public Utilities Commission goal of 90% um, of all new homes reaching 20% better um, than the 2008 code by 2015. And then in the longer term, a little more well-known are these 2020 goals by which um, all new construction would be uh, gear net energy. So these programs um, uh, target to support those goals. And uh, we actually gave a few other presentations on, on um, specifically zero net energy. So you can check out our websites and, and um, learn more about that. Um, and just a last note about um, program incentives. Uh, we don't expect them to change, but just check back and, and um, we will um, keep everyone in the loop if there's any adjustments. But um, you'll, you'll actually be learning a little bit about our incentive structure in this webinar. So um, if you have any questions about that, um, you can shoot us a, a question in the question bar. Next slide. Great. So um, in addition to myself, I've actually got two other folks who also work with TRC who support the programs who will be joining to, to present on um, a few of the topics today. So we've got Melissa Buckley, who actually works out of our office in San Diego and has done a lot of work with multifamily um, programs. And uh, she'll be presenting today on marketing and recruitment. So some best practices there. And then Kevin Robison, who works with both CAP and CMFNH doing plan review. Um, he will be reviewing application best practices as well as um, recommendations for plan review. And then I will be hopping back on to uh, present on verification. So CAP and CMFNH um, have pretty similar structures for participation. 
that we're able to present on both today. There are some exceptions, so we'll be addressing those. But our goal is always to make it a lot easier for you to participate, um, as easy as possible. And uh, as always, if you have ideas for how we can simplify things and make them easier for you, uh, certainly get in touch with us um, and, and you know, we can assess whichever situations there are. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Melissa to, to talk to us about marketing. Great. Thank you, Shannon. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Melissa Buckley, and as Shannon mentioned, I have done a lot of work here at TRC with a number of the multifamily programs that we implement and primarily have focused on uh, marketing and recruitment. So today I wanted to talk with you about some best practices, uh, share some resources, and really try to equip you uh, with what you need to create meaningful sales conversations. So part of why we wanted to lead off with marketing and recruitment is that oftentimes the HERS Raider or energy consultant might be a potential participant's or builder's first uh, interaction with these programs. So it, when you're having conversations with your clients or potential clients about the services that you provide, oftentimes that's a great introductory point for both CAF and CMFNH. So we thought that we would go over a few uh, points with you today so that you can feel confident in, in having those interactions and closing the deal, as they say. So. When you're approaching a prospective client or maybe coming back to uh, a previous client, it's important that you first really understand and appeal to that uh, client's values. So people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, and when you are selling your services, and when you're selling these programs in particular, it's really important to understand um, the why of what these these programs do, and particularly the why of what you do, so that that's what you can sell uh, to your prospective clients. So, and as part of that, you know, you need to be ready to respond to some of the common challenges that we see in the energy efficiency industry. Um, you know, a, a big thing is obviously understanding how efficiency uh, can benefit the bottom line, either at a multifamily property or for single-family homes. Um, and part of that can also be making sure that you're familiar with some common marketing concerns or um, challenges that they might have so that you can position energy efficiency as a potential solution. So what is it that they're looking for to make their property stand out, and how can energy efficiency help them do that? At the same time, um, while you probably know there are a number of, of maybe more skeptical folks out there or those that uh, are less inclined to strive for deeper and greater energy efficiency, there are also those that totally dig it and are into it. and um, we don't want to ignore those people either. You know, they, they have green-minded qualities. They want to be the leaders uh, in maybe adopting new technology or exceeding code requirements. So, so make sure that you know who you're dealing with so that you can appeal to um, the correct position. And, and lastly, uh, as many of you probably know, if you're experienced in participating in these programs, energy efficiency you know, doesn't just impact the bottom line, it also really helps you create a case for comfort and, and durability and some continued maintenance and operation benefits um, that you can see in both single and multifamily properties. So again, these are just a few uh, of the, the more common challenges or points that we often hear come up in some of these initial conversations. So when you're getting ready to have one, make sure that you have responses ready to address some of those. And then lastly, um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, take advantage of some of the resources that we're going to show you. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's much easier for somebody to understand uh, a more tangible example of something than, than it is uh, for them to comprehend what you're trying to say uh, just verbally. 
So with that, um, I want to go into the toolkit that we've put together for you. And there's a couple components of it. We'll walk through some samples of each of them. Um, but this is basically a package of materials that you can use when you are uh, meeting with folks about CAP and CMFNH and hopefully can help you identify also um, what you know well about the program, maybe some other areas that you might need to brush up on in preparation for uh, meeting with these folks and also highlight for you, um, you know, how you can pull in your own experience and your own work on the program. So this slide is showing uh, basic program flyers. Um, the CMFNH flyer is on the left um, and is pretty straightforward. You know, it, it at least gives them something for uh, them to refer back to in case they didn't have that pen and paper to to write down the contact information or your contact information. And same is true for the one on the right for the CAP um, flyer, you know, a basic flyer that's going to hopefully jog their memory um, about your conversation and, and why these programs are a good fit for them. And, and on that vein, we also want to make sure that we provide you with some of those examples that I was referring to. So, the toolkit also includes case studies. Uh, again, CMFNH has a case study on the left and CAP case studies are on the right. Um, and you'll see that the branding and the colors for both programs are pretty distinct, so it's pretty easy to spot them throughout, um, throughout these pieces, which is which. CAP is green and CMFNH is pretty much blue and yellow. Anyway, these case studies can really help a, a developer or builder understand how they can apply something like this to their own project. It gives them high-level information about, you know, what energy efficiency measures they actually included in construction, what their energy savings levels were, um, you know, who uh, participated on the team, who was the, the rater and consultant, and the incentive, you know, what everybody's always interested in the money, right? So it also will list, um, may list the incentive amount, and that can be really important uh, in some of your conversations. The other thing I want to mention here, too, is that um, both programs are always interested in new case studies. So if you have worked with CAP or CMFNH before and you have a great project and would like to have it featured as a, a model case study, you can get in touch with Shannon. And again, she had mentioned our contact information will be at the end of the presentation. But she can uh, help you to develop that case study so that you can include that in your, your toolkit. So a few other things in the toolkits. Uh, we have the application for each program so that, you know, in the instance that you're meeting with that green-minded person who gets it and is excited. They, can't, they can take advantage, not waste any time, get started on the application. Um, for those that might need a little more time, this is a good resource to, to show them, you know, what do they kind of need to get in place? What are the types of details about the project that the program is looking for to be able to enroll them? Additionally, we're providing a handout on each of the incentive structures um, for the programs and Kevin and Shannon are going to be speaking about incentives a little bit later but these handouts basically break down the entry point. Um, Kevin will talk about the CAP score but the minimum score required is 84 for low rise for multifamily and 84 for single family and incentives uh, will increase the with greater efficiency, so as your score lowers, you'll get a greater incentive. Um, but again, going back to the bottom line and people wanting to know about the money, this can also provide them with a clear picture of, of what they can expect to gain uh, from participating in this program. So just to highlight again the resources that we talked about, the toolkit, as I mentioned, is going to be available online, um, and I believe we may also send it out as part of the follow-up email to this webinar so that you can access it easily. Uh, the other thing I didn't 
quite mention um, in regard to the case studies that I showed you is be equipped to speak to your own work. So maybe you haven't participated in one of these programs before and you've done something similar. I wouldn't be surprised if that client is going to be asking you, okay, so what have you done that's like this that, that you can now do for me? If you have uh, participated in these programs, that's great. You know, as I mentioned, you can work with Shannon to get one of your projects um, as a featured case study. And, and even if you don't want to go that far, be prepared to speak to the project components and what you were able to do for that client and how you were able to help them leverage this program to achieve some of the goals that they had for their project. Another thing I want to touch upon quickly is expanding your, your network. Um, some of you might have been doing this for a while, so this could be old hat. Some of you could be new to this arena and might not know exactly where to look to build that network and, and to start having these conversations, getting to know people, getting to know these builders and, and who's out there. So consider joining a trade association or two. Let, you know, look into different building associations. There's a plethora of, of them throughout California, both um, that are statewide and then local, uh, a number of contractor associations that could um, put you in touch with folks that know somebody else, you know, that might be interested in this program. Um, and then lastly, for especially for multifamily, uh, check out property management or apartment associations. A lot of times you'll find in that industry, in the multifamily industry, that um, as you may in any industry actually, people will do business with people that they know. And the better that you can get to know the people that you want to do business with, uh, the better position you will be in to do that business and to close those deals and to, to build those relationships. So just keep those in mind when you're looking to maybe expand your network. And then lastly, I want to turn you to a really great resource when it comes to selling energy efficiency. Some of you may have heard of Mark Jewell. He, uh, he's the president of um, the Energy Efficiency Funding Group and is a trainer, a, a very well-respected trainer um, and professional in this area that has been working with um, everything from large you know, utilities down to individual programs to equip people to sell energy efficiency. And he has just released a book. And in the PowerPoint, when you receive this presentation, number four here will link you to the book if you're interested in getting it online. But he's got this great book, Selling Energy, that gives you a number of great tips about how to really make this happen. And, and how to handle some of the challenges we identified earlier and, and how to really equip yourself and make sure you're putting your best foot forward when you're going out to um, market these programs. So at this point, Shannon, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, I don't actually see any questions right now. So if okay. you have one that's on the tip of your tongue uh, or fingers, I certainly encourage you to enter it. Um, I also wanted to mention a few other resources which uh, came to me as you were presenting, Melissa. Um, so if you're looking for additional ways that um, uh, that you can highlight work that you've done with the programs, um, a lot of you probably subscribe to the CAP and CMF and H newsletters, which we issue quarterly. Um, and we always feature a project of the quarter. So this is the project that gets the top Title 24 percentage. I guess we'll have to reassess that as we start getting projects using the, um, the score in 2013. But um, we always highlight the project team um, who worked on the top project of the, of the, um, of the quarter. Um, and then also, a few months ago, we included in our newsletter a link to the project map. I guess at this point it's just for CMF and H, but we've been interested in creating one for CAP as well. So on cmfnh.com, uh, you can go to the project map and we actually list, um, 
I need to update it for the past couple months, but, but we list uh, projects that have completed to date. And this includes incentive information, which is public. So you can look and see, you know, what are my peers doing or what have other projects that I've done, um, uh, what kinds of incentive have they received, where are they located, how many units are they. We also include if the project participated in other green programs like LEED or Greenpoint rated. So uh, that's another way if you're looking through um, if you're looking through the, the the project map, you can kind of get a better sense of uh, what other projects are going on and and what um, you know. And we're also featuring some of your projects as well. Um, let's see. I do have a question coming in. Let me see. So, a question um, about the code. So, as many of you know, we just went into uh, the 2013 Title 24 standards, and those launched on July 1st. So CAP and CMFNH are both open to new projects um, that are achieving a score of 84, which means that they have uh, reached a certain performance level. Roughly, I'm telling folks, it's roughly equivalent to 15% above 2013 code. Um, I say roughly because the score we created to, um, uh, for a number of reasons, but but one of the benefits of the score is that it's more equitable in different climate zones. So depending on what climate zone you're in, the percentage above 2013 code could vary, you know, more or less than 15 percent. Um, so, so the score is a little bit different um, than, well, it's quite different from, from the um, percent above code, but 15 percent is kind of a, a benchmark comparison just, just so you guys know what we're talking about. So um, those programs will require that projects meet all the mandatory requirements for the new code and then exceed the code to get this, um, this score. And actually for high-rise we are in process of developing the score. So um, for CMF and H high-rise projects we are still using 15% of code as an entry. So this is different actually than, um, than the program we ran in 2010 and 2000, uh, well, I guess 2012 to 2013, it was 20% above 2008 code. Uh, so now it's 15% above 2013 for high-rise projects. Hopefully that wasn't too much information, and hopefully that answers your question. Uh, if you if you want me to clarify, I can. Um, Shannon, I, I have just one more point that came to mind before we go on to Kevin. Please. And, and that would be, um, as Shannon mentioned, some other some of the other uh, either green certification or energy efficiency types of programs. When you're preparing to kind of pitch this program to somebody, it would also behoove you to be familiar with those other programs because oftentimes uh, a builder either may have experience with another program like Greenpoint Rated or uh, Energy Star New Homes or what have you, um, and that may be their best comparison point. So the more that you uh, know about those programs or perhaps are interested in pursuing them again and seeing how these uh, PG&E programs can align with them, um, the better positioned you are to, to be a resource to them and, and to help them kind of navigate through this. So that's just one other thought to consider. Thanks, Melissa. That's great. Um, and, and I'll, I actually have one more question that came in, just to uh, circle back on the case studies. So um, I, this is Shannon talking, I can uh, work with you to develop those. And so the, the toolkit, in case it wasn't clear, we have a, one toolkit for CAP and one toolkit for CMF and H, and they're both PDF. So all of the pages are enclosed in one document. Um, and then if you want to work with me to customize the toolkit so that it includes a project that you have worked on, um, I can help you to prepare that um, so that, you know, it's something you can print out and share or it's something that you can also, um, uh, let's see, so oh, I got another question. Uh, it's something that you can also share electronically. So it should be, it's something that, you know, you can easily, um, distribute with your clients. 
so I have one other question about um, DOE Zero Energy Ready. I think I'm going to wait to take that until Kevin uh, presents. Um, so there's a, a few extra um, uh, points that you can get in CAP um, for a few extra categories. So I'll, I'll let Kevin address those in his section. Uh, so I think uh, those are great questions. Uh, thank you. And, and I think we'll move on to Kevin's section. So Kevin is the uh, plan review manager for CAP and CMFNH. So he's um, a, a real expert on building science. Um, our goal is to be as available to you as we can to support um, uh, your energy models and your energy policies as a company um, for, for design. So um, he is a great contact, so I'll let him um, take it away with uh, the application process. Okay, thanks Shannon. Hi everyone, my name is Kevin. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the application process and the plan review process and some best practices that everyone can use uh, just to make the process smoother for everyone and to save us all um, as much time as possible and yet still uh, make sure we're doing everything we need to do to, um, to meet the program participation guidelines. <clears throat> so the first part is the application best practices. Number one fundamental thing is to submit an entire application package um, as soon as possible. As early in a project as you can to submit an uh, entire application package. And this just helps us get all the documents and be able to start working and on plan review in the project right away. Um, and we do have an application checklist that I'll show on the next slide. So you can use that just to make sure you have all your documents in place. And we just ask that you clearly label all the documents. This is just a an example of one format you could use, um, but it just helps if you can just label them somehow so we know if we're dealing with specifications or drawings or the application itself, just to name the files, just to, just to streamline it on our end so we know what we're looking at just by the file uh, type name. It just makes it a lot easier. Um, and then one thing I'll mention here, and I'll mention it again in a few slides, but to use a highlighter or circle uh, the model or efficiency of the equipment that you're going to be using on a specific specification sheet. Like for a window or HVAC equipment, sometimes they'll have a generic spec sheet that has 10 different models. So we just ask that you tell us the exact model that you're going to be using on the project so we can correlate that with the, the actual energy model that has been submitted for our plan review. Um, and the next point is to we want to make sure we initiate the plan review before any HERS testing or drywall has gone up in the project. So that's why we want you to get a ap complete application to us as early as possible so we make sure we start the plan review before any of those things happen in the field. And this isn't really, it's not an arbitrary date that we just decided we want to have the plan review documents in. It's really, if we can review the project before drywall goes up and before any HERS testing is done, we feel we still may be able to influence the project and that's really one of the offerings we have in both these programs is design assistance. So we would like to be able to have a project early enough in design so that we can do the review and, and offer some suggestions to improve the project. Um, so if we get too late in the game then we're not able to, to make those suggestions and they're not able to happen in the field. So that's why we have that cutoff date. Um, another best practice to share the project or add TRC as the project on the project team in the appropriate registry, which right now for new projects is CalCERTs, and we're all expecting Cheers to be approved in the near future, uh, but for now CalCERTs is the only registry approved. Um, and then just maintain communication with the project team. Just let everyone involved know if there's any changes on the HVAC design or new windows got spec for the project. It's nice just to keep everyone informed of that. Um, we can go on to the next slide, please. So these are the application checklists that I mentioned uh, during the last slide. And these are both, these lists are both available on each of the program's websites. Um, so I know they're really small and you can't really read them, but it's basically what you need uh, for that complete application package, which is an application both programs require a PG&E proof of service document 
Um, the CMF and H program requires a W-9 for the developer and the energy consultant. Um, that's not something that's required for CAP. And then both programs require Title 24 documentation and an architectural plan set. And then also for CAP, um, we also need a site plan with a north arrow and then a list of the lots and addresses that are going to be included uh, on the project and also uh, the equipment specifications for, for both programs uh, so that we, we know the equipment that's being inspected and being modeled um, for those projects. So again, yeah, these are available on the website and you can, just a good tool to use to make sure we have all the documents we need when you're submitting an application. So next, please. So here I'm going to talk a little bit about the CAP score and CMF and H score. So right now CBEC Res will generate the CAP score and CMF and H score and will report your uh, correlating incentive. However, if you're using Energy Pro, uh, which I know a lot of people are, um, Energy Pro doesn't currently output the score. So what we have is a, a calculator tool that you can get on our website and you can download this and use the, in, use the outputs from Energy Pro or CBEC Res if you want, but it, it generates that for you. So you take the energy outputs from Energy Pro, punch them in the calculator, it will give you the score your project is at currently and also the correlated incentive. And so just so you're aware, if you haven't sat on um, any of these webinars in the past, the entry score for both the CAP program and CMF and H is a score of 84. And each score is correlated with an incentive. So as your score lowers, your incentive uh, gets larger. And that's because we're the way the score is set up is that we're trying to drive towards zero net energy. Uh, it's no longer a percent above Title 24. It's now a sliding scale that goes from 100 down to zero uh, as we drive towards zero net energy. So the lower the score, the more efficient your home, and the higher the incentive. Um, Kevin, before you move on to CMF and H, can you talk sure. a little bit about the extra bonuses um, oh, right. that, that CAP can do? So this is just for CAP and it's statewide, but they have some extra bonuses. Right. So we have, a, I think there's currently four bonuses that you can get. So once the software tells you your CAP score, you can further reduce your CAP score and increase your incentive uh, with these CAP bonuses. So the first one is the 2016 code preparation bonus, which is a five-point bonus. And you get that by installing a, a suite of five measures in your project, two of those being either high-performance attics or ducts and condition space and high-performance walls. And then there's a couple other measures that go along with that, but the, the two we're, we're really focusing on is the, the high-performance attics and ducts and condition space and high-performance walls. Uh, those are the two two measures in, in that bonus that are um, our focus. Uh, one of the other bonus is if your home is going to be participating in the Department of Energy Zero Energy Ready Home program, there's a three-point bonus. And then we also have two bonuses if for actual energy use, annual energy use. So if you're less than 100,000 kilotdv, for the year for your project, then you will receive a five-point bonus. And then if you're less than 60,000 kilotdv, you'll receive an additional five points bonus. And the way the cap structure, the cap incentive structure works is you get $100 a point um, from 84 to 75. And then if you get a score below 75, it increases to $200 a point. So a five-point bonus can be an additional $500 to $1,000 uh, for your home. Um, and if anybody needs help calculating the annual energy use, this has come up in a few phone calls, uh, feel free to contact me and we can go over it. I won't go into the, the details here. Um, but yeah, I'm available if anyone has any questions about that. So I think we can go to the next slide. So similar to the CAP score, the CMF and H score is also an entry of 84. And we have a calculator tool, just the same as CAP, 
on the CMFNH website and you can download that calculator and calculate your score and the correlated incentive. And I just want to point out that for the CMFNH uh, score and incentive, the incentives are per unit. So if you have a multifamily property with five units, you're going to multiply um, that incentive by five. So that what gets reported is, is per unit. So um, just wanted to mention that. Otherwise, you can go to the, the website and download the tool and use that to calculate your incentive and score. Click the next slide, please. Can I, so, can, can I interrupt you with one more question? Sure, sure. Okay. So um, I was remembering hearing about when the the incentive report will be available in Energy Pro. Is that the next release in October on October twenty second? Yeah, so there's a, a cap incentive report that will be similar to the old util one R that we used to have um, in the the old program cycle and that will report your cap score and cap incentive um, and give you all your energy use details. And yes, uh, we're expecting that's going to be available in the next release of CBEC Res, which is October 22nd. And we've also talked with Energy Pro and WrightSoft, and expecting soon after that October 22nd release that that report will also get incorporated into Energy Pro and WrightSoft. Um, it probably won't happen that day, but and I would hope that in the next couple of weeks after that that release, those will be included in the other softwares. Uh, and then we don't have to worry about the calculator because um, it'll all be in the in the report. And the, the the we call it a tool, but it's really not intimidating. It's just a spreadsheet where you input a few numbers. So uh, the it will certainly be nice once the reports just output when you run your models. But um, right now it's it's not a huge burden either just to run the spreadsheet. So um, it, right. it's been a a few questions about some of the energy end uses and what the spreadsheet calls them because the spreadsheet was based on what CBEC Res uses, the terms that CBEC Res uses, and Energy Pro uses for a couple of the items uses a slightly different term. It's pretty, it's, it's somewhat clear where the number should go. If you have any questions, just feel free to, to give us a call and, and we can help walk you through that spreadsheet. Anything else, Shannon? That's it, I think. Thanks. OK. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a few of the best practices for the plan review process itself. Um, and so these are some of the things that, that we see. And we hope that you can incorporate uh, when you're submitting projects to, just to make the whole process uh, smoother for the plan review and for the project, the whole project team in general. Um, so the first thing is to communicate all model and plan updates to the plan review team. So what we do is when we're going to start plan review in a project, what we try and do is a week before we're going to do the plan review or a couple days, we'll send out an email letting the project team know that, hey, we're about to start plan review. Um, are these the most current energy models and documents and drawings that, that you have? So in case there have been any changes, that's the chance for the project team to to submit us updated models if there are any. Or if not, just shoot us back an email and say, no, those are the most up-to-date. Um, and it really helps because if we don't get an email back, eventually we'll start doing the plan review. And then if we, a week later, get updated models, then we pretty much have to start over and treat it like a brand new project and start the plan review process all again. So um, if, we're, if we get communication that everything's up-to-date, it, it makes things go a lot smoother. Um, and then I think. Something I mentioned before, just to ensure labeling of the models and files, um, just to make it as straightforward as possible so we can look at a file and know what that file includes. Um, another one is to ensure the model square footage in the energy model matches the square footage on the plans. And this is just the easiest way we, we have to ensure that the model is for the specific plan. And I know that they get lots of options, but the model square footage needs to match the plan square footage and um, it, it just we need it to match in, in order for the program purposes. Another thing is the orientation for custom homes. Um, 
and all the energy models and energy modelers out there do this. Uh, it's just something we see um, missed a few of the times because a lot of the modelers are doing it um, to production homes where you just do all the four cardinal orientations. So it's just a reminder if you're doing a custom home, just pay attention to uh, the orientation, um, and then we'll that'll be easier for for everyone. <clears throat> And then highlight the specification sheets. I mentioned this before. Uh, this just helps us ensure that we're the energy model is including the actual equipment that's being specified. And what I what I see maybe 40 to 50 percent of the time is a generic cut sheet of all the windows offered by a manufacturer, um, and without any highlights. And so it just makes it tough because we'd like to for the project team to let us know the, the specific windows that are being used on the project. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the photovoltaic credit that's, I, I believe, a check mark, checkbox in the software. And so this isn't allowed for a compliance credit in the CAP program or the CMF and H program. Um, so you want to leave that box unchecked because we can't give you any compliance credit for solar for our programs. Our, programs are geared at energy efficiency. However, if you are going to participate in a new solar homes partnership, then you're allowed to use PVE for a compliance credit if you're going in there tier one or tier two. If you're just um, code compliant, then you can't use that credit um, for NSHP. But if you are in tier one or tier two, tier two, you can use that, that solar credit for a compliance percentage. Okay, next slide, please. So these are just some common things that, that we see in the plan review, uh, things to look out for, and you know our goal is to, to minimize the number of comments we have to make. So the goal is that we can get energy models that are clean first time through, then that saves everyone time. Um, so these the U factor and the solar heat gain coefficient values impact on compliance. Um, I would just it's, it's nice when the windows are modeled exactly as they're specified. I see a lot of models that all the windows are modeled as a 0.32, 0.32 for U-factor and solar heat gain coefficient. Even though the windows that are being installed might actually be a lot better and you might gain compliance and get an increased incentive for your client. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Please, please model the, the windows as they're specified. Um, it often helps helps the model. I'd say it helps the model more times than, than hurts. But lots of times the model, windows being specified are, are much better than the prescriptive standards. <clears throat> and then the, just a reminder, everyone does this already. So the glazing areas in the production homes, we need to model the worst case scenario, so the largest number of glazing um, if there are different, different model types. And then water heater type and efficiency, uh, this is just something I see modeled. It will get the specifications will say one thing and the energy model says another. And it can become especially important if we're using a heat pump water heater uh, as we just need to pay attention to those um, because the modeling is a little bit different. And then the HVAC type, SEER and EAR values uh, influence the compliance margin a good deal. And so please just um, include the the SEER and EAR values that are on the specification sheet. Again, this is kind of like the windows. I often see these modeled as a 13 SEER, 11 EER, where the one that's being spec'd is a 14 SEER and 12.5 EER. So it actually helps the model once we go through the, the comments and get that up, the energy model updated. Um, and then thermal mass modeling. Uh, if you're going to take credit for the thermal mass, uh, please just include a set of plans that show the finishes and so we can see exactly where the thermal mass is, is coming from and the plans. And exterior shading uh, for overhangs and fins, again, this is often an area that's just kind of left off the model where it can really increase your compliance and help out your cap score and your incentive if you model the, the overhangs and fins um, in the model. And these, you know, can be from the building itself or from actual overhangs and fins on the windows. but um, I would encourage everyone to, to model those as accurately as possible, and it, and it really will help uh, the compliance. And that's, that's all I have. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to 
answer them. Kevin, can you talk a little bit about um, the process, kind of on what, how it looks like on our end, just to give everyone a sense of the the flow of like so you know a product submits the application package then what so as soon as they sub we have a complete application package then it gets released for plan review and then so it gets assigned to a plan reviewer and then the plan reviewer goes through and looks for any discrepancies or any issues with the model um, if everything looks fine and the model is as it should be, uh, then we'll approve the, the plans and then it'll get submitted to PG&E for their approval. Um, if we find some things in the model that we have questions about or we think need changing, then we'll send comments back to the project team and then we give uh, 10 business days to receive comments back. And then so we wait until we receive updated models and any new specification sheets, and then we'll do a, a second set of plan review. And at that point, it's usually any issues are straightened out, and then we'll approve it and send it to PG&E for approval. Um, once in a while, we have a second round of comments that go out. And that second round, uh, then we give you five business days to get back to us, just because at that point, we, we want to finish up the project and move on to other projects that are in the queue. Um, does that answer the question, Shannon? Yeah, yeah, that was actually my question. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, just just so that you guys know, so TRC runs both programs, and and we've got a bunch of people working and contributing. Um, and the primary contact, I'm well. So this is Shannon. I'm the primary contact for California Multifamily New Homes. So when you have a an application, um, you could submit it to uh, info at cmfnh.com, and that'll be in, I'll, I'll include that in the follow-up email that goes out uh, tomorrow. And then Deborah uh, will be, she is your primary contact for applications for uh, CAP, so you can email CAP at trcsolutions.com uh, with your CAP application packages. Um, and then Kevin is, is the one who delegates out plan review, so you'll be hearing either from him or from um, a few other folks at TRC. It could be Deborah or Cheryl or even Matt. Um, so uh, just, I almost wish I'd included the pictures so you could see because it's, it's too bad that, you know, we don't get to interact so much in person. But, um, uh, you know, everyone's, everyone's really knowledgeable about, about building science, so if you have questions also about you know, switching things around or going into value engineering, um, you can certainly uh, get in touch with us about that. Um, and I also just had one other point about um, submitting your application packages. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and I work more with CMF and H, uh, but uh, you can submit your, your energy models uh, as soon as you're confident that the outputs are, you know, running accurately. I know the first few runs of Energy Pro 6 have been challenging for folks, and um, so, you know, you don't have to wait until you're pulling permits, um, and for us, and also for you just to be able to meet that cutoff of installing drywall, it's better to get everything in early, um, and projects have 36 months to complete construction upon enrollment, so that's usually a pretty good time frame. I think 36 months for CAP. Is it different, Kevin? No, I believe that's correct. Yeah, so 36 months is usually a pretty good time frame, especially for single family, to complete construction. So um, there's never really a good reason to, to wait. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, you know, we're, up, we're open for applications. So um, uh, you can get in touch with me or Deborah to learn more about that. Um, okay, and I see two other questions from folks who are attending. So Kevin, I'm already I can already tell that these are going to go to you. Um, okay. So <laughs> the first one: uh, Are ACA manual J, D, and S calculations required as part of the mechanical plan? No, we don't require that. 
great. <laughs> um, and, but we do we do require the full MEPS plan set. So um, I think well, CAP's always been this way, but CMF and H, we this year started only needing PDF plan sets. So that's kind of nice. Uh, you don't have to send us those huge rolls anymore. Uh, and then uh, one other question. Is solar thermal for domestic hot water allowed to be used? Uh, I know it's yes and no, so I'll let Kevin answer that as well. For, yes, yeah, it is allowed to be used for compliance uh, for the CAP program. You just need to supply um, and it's slipping my mind right now that the actual form that's needed to take that, that credit in the model, um, but that is allowed. And that's the F chart, right? Yes, thank you. Um, and so the, the, the no part of that answer is that if you're taking solar thermal incentives through CSI, the California Solar Initiative, you can't take those for CAP and CMF and H. Last I heard, um, CSI was at capacity, so maybe someone else has more recent information than me, but if you are doing solar thermal, uh, it's in your interest to include that now um, because you uh, will not be able to apply for incentives for CSI until they open uh, for new applications. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, and I don't think I see any other questions coming in yet. Okay, so I, I think we can go to the next slide and uh, I think it's me talking about verification. Okay, so we already talked a little bit about enrollment. Um, I wanted to include this slide because it really clearly defines what the roles are um, for each participant. So. We talk a lot about the project team, and um, for our perspective, TRC, we're talking about the developer or builder, um, usually a primary contact there. It's really nice for us to be able to talk with one or maybe two people at a project just to, to make things efficient. Um, I'm also talking about the energy consultant, which is the, right now, CEPE, Certified Energy Plans Examiner. So this is the person whose name is on the energy model runs. This person also takes responsibility for that model. So even if you weren't the first person to develop it, if you're the one that is submitting the model, we will consider you kind of the prime Title 24 consultant for that project. Um, and then the third person is the HERS rater. Uh, so the person that's going on, on site for verification. And so both programs, CAP and CMF and H, required that you have a HERS rater um, uh, to certify the measures and also the additional energy features uh, for the project. So uh, let's just walk through enrollment. So TRC conducts plan review. This is kind of after we get the application package in prior to drywall. Uh, then we submit the, the kind of plan review results and our recommendations to PG&E. Uh, to approve enrollment, and then uh, then the rater may begin site verification. So that's kind of the beginning stages. Uh, verification, so at this point uh, we're trying to keep in touch with everyone, but especially the developer and the rater. Um, as a rater, you, you can be so helpful to us just letting us know when you uh, expect kind of what your timeline is, so when you expect to be completing verification on site, especially letting us know if there's any delays in, in testing, if any lots or units are failing, and you expect that you'll be going out on site again later, kind of giving us a sense of, of when, uh, of when that, those will be um, uh, wrapping up. Because we do, we do um, for, for PG&E and also for the developer, um, just try to keep everyone informed of, of the timeline and, and when we'll be submitting projects. Okay, so uh, after, so when the raider's out on site, uh, uh, certifying HERS measures, obviously, but then also the additional energy features of the project. Um, for CMF and H, we have um, uh, what's called an energy measure summary sheet, which uh, we generate after um, 
uh, the project completes plan review, just showing what the general specifications are for HVAC systems, domestic hot water, um, envelope. So uh, we would ask the rater to mark up uh, that sheet with the as-built conditions if there's anything that changes. So this is CMFNH. CAP does, does not require uh, the energy measure summary. Um, and then the rater completes work in the registry, certifying any um, HERS measures if they're taken, and then any um, and the additional energy features. Uh, then the uh, so I guess yeah. So then the rater sends the marked up additional energy features report, which um, we send to the Title Twenty Four consultant. So there's um, there's a lot of flow and work between different members of the project team. So uh, I should clarify too at this point, I'm still talking about CMFNH with um, the energy consultant's responsibility at this point. Um, so CMFNH runs an as-built model, which we use to inform the final incentive. So CAP does not do this. So you can just ignore this if you <laughs> are only working on CAP. But uh, the energy consultant um, is responsible for developing the as-built model, just considering what the HERS rater uh, has indicated as uh, the as-built condition. So then um, we, once we receive the revised model, we can generate the final project savings, um, and then we will submit the project to PG&E. So for CAP, um, I'll go through it actually a little more specifically to CAP in the, in the next couple of slides, but that's the general flow. So we're always available to help out, and we want to be in the loop, and we want to keep you in the loop as far as what's going on. Um, so uh, if you have questions about, about this, you can um, either submit to um, uh, you can either submit a question through the question bar or you can um, email me. Next slide. Great. So best practices, I think I've hit on this pretty well. Maintain communication with TRC, uh, report delays, um, and document all measures. Um, one of the big things we've been seeing lately is, um, I didn't, I'm not quite sure what's up, but so if uh, a project is unable to document NFRC ratings on a window. Um, that could cause challenges if we have to use default um, uh, window conditions for CMF and H with these as-built as models. That's just one example. Also, we've seen some things with um, uh, windows being changed. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, you know, it's normal that a project would change specifications um, between these early plans these early models that we review at enrollment and then completion. Um, sometimes uh, we've seen windows actually go to a super efficient uh, window and maybe it wasn't the most appropriate thing for uh, the climate zone and we've seen incentives drop because of that um, because maybe that, that building would have benefited from a little more solar gain. Just one example. Um, but uh, just certainly things to consider um, how they impact your energy savings. Um, and a note on um, incentive processing. So uh, we say within three months that, that pg and will review incentive requests. It's often a little bit sooner than that. But if you're wondering, you know, where's my incentive, you can email me um, or uh, the, the CAP email. Uh, cap at prcsolutions.com if you uh, are curious about what's up. Uh, next slide. Great. So here's some common issues. I think these are actually more related to CAP. So uh, for CAP, in verification, um, kind of as projects are wrapping up, uh, CAP requires an IRF, an incentive request form, um, and so uh, this lists what um, lots, kind of what plan type and what orientation a lot is, and the incentive is based on 
um, that uh, plan type and orientation. Uh, so, so before you're submitting this incentive request form, uh, please make sure that the, those lots have completed and passed in the registry, because we do go on there and check, and we will um, have to return it if we see that the project has not passed. Um, and uh, also, just reference, we, we're happy to share with you what um, plan types we reviewed when we did plan review, because sometimes I know a lot of time has passed between plan review and project completion. Um, if you are curious what plan type we reviewed, um, we can send you a list. Um, but just make sure that what that the names of the plans match what we reviewed. Otherwise, we'll have to come back and ask you questions about that. Um, and then the incentive request form. Um, just I think a lot of you know this, but this um, we really like when HERS writers and consultants help the the builders coordinate. Um, completion, but this particular form um, needs to be signed by the uh, the builder. Next slide. Thanks. So some more cap um, cap things, and the reason that there's a little bit more detail on the cap uh, verification and completion process is because. Um, the submittal process for CAP is a little bit different because we enroll lots. And so for CAP, um, uh, you can actually, actually submit partial projects. So you might have, um, say, 10 lots that completed construction in HERS. Um, uh, and then you know maybe 10 more would come in the following month or a couple months later. For CMF and H, the project completes all at once. Um, so uh, there's a little more uh, nuance there. So, um, uh, so okay. The first note is to submit badges of lots whenever possible. So this is a special request from Lori, who works with TRC also, and she is uh, she coordinates all the incentive for CAP, um, and so it helps her out a lot when you um, submit a number of lots on an IRF instead of, you know, just a couple. Um, so that's a note. And then um, for CAP, if you have a large project with a lot of lots, um, if you're not keeping track of which ones have been submitted, um, kind of what the status of those are, uh, we really encourage you to do so. Um, I think there's been times where we've seen um, incentive requests for lots that have already um, been paid or rejected and we're still waiting for certain things to correct there. So um, we can also send you a list of lots to show what the status is from our perspective. Um, and I think I touched on the third point before. Just make sure you note what the specific plan type is on the incentive request form. If you're not sure, again, you can certainly get in touch with us and we'll let you know what plan types we reviewed and what the names were. Um, so yes, this is the plan check verification summary sheet. So, so get in touch with us if you don't have that already for your project. Um, so a specific thing for projects that are taking solar, um, just be aware of what um, certifications you need to do in the registry. Um, you will need to complete those. Uh, before you request the incentive. Um, okay, and then um, Greenpoint rated kicker. So in the past, CASP has offered a number of different kickers. Um, and so the new kind of flow for this year is the bonus points. Um, so we don't offer all of the same kickers that we used to. So um, you can check out uh, the website or email us if you have questions about what kickers we're offering. Uh, next slide. Great. Okay, these are my last few slides on verification. Um, and the first one I think we've addressed pretty well. Why must I wait to begin verification until my project successfully completes TRC plan review? So our goal, um, obviously we're providing a service of issuing incentives for your great energy efficient projects. Um, we also are available to support design assistance, um, and we want to be available to do that. Um, and so 
we have identified um, drywall um, as kind of that cutoff where projects are less likely to be able to change their scope of work. So obviously you're not able to um, make any adjustments to your insulation installation. Um, but also because earlier in um, the design process is the most uh, it's the ideal time to make adjustments to your scope. We've seen a lot of evidence that um, uh, that changes to the scope early in the design process are much more cost effective. So, so that's, that's a few reasons why we have that requirement. What do I need to do to receive my incentive? Uh, so uh, the first step, um, notify us when the project is complete in the registry. Um, and we can help, I know a lot of you have questions about CMF and H high-rise projects. We can work with you individually on that um, for getting those projects loaded up onto the registry. Um, to uh, encourage the builder, or you uh, can also contact us when the project or lot is complete. Just so that, because we are often in the registry looking around on projects. Um, but it's really helpful for us if you let us know when they are complete in the registry because um, we don't always check all the time. So um, it, it saves us the time of needing to go on and check. And then uh, submitting the documents on time. Um, so just in a timely manner before, obviously before the, the project expires within 36 months of completion, um, but just because you want I know our clients are, uh, uh, your clients, developers and builders are excited to get their incentives. So just submitting those as um, as soon as you're done with, with site verification is the best time. Um, and then uh, the energy measure summary sheet in, is what we're looking for for CMF and H, not that, the, the IRF. Uh, I think there's one more FAQ on the next slide. Great. So a lot of you have already kind of taken on this role with your clients, um, builders and developers, to support coordination. I know a lot of companies have a specific person designated to support green programs and applications for those. Um, and I think that that makes you look good to your clients, that you're able to facilitate that process. It's also nice for us as, a, as program implementers to have a single contact to get in touch with when we need status updates and um, to communicate information to a larger project team. Um, so, so we welcome you to help coordinate um, not only aspects of verification but also for plan review as well, collecting documents for the application package um, and just letting us know of what your timeline is for, for um, construction and verification completion. Um, and just in terms of roles, again, um, for verification, um, for CAP, I mentioned before Lori is the primary contact for um, installations, we call them, uh, submittals, completing projects, those are all kind of synonyms. And um, for many years, Keith Sage has been the verification coordinator for CMF and H. Um, and he's actually moved on. So Megan Da is going to be the new contact for CMF and H. So she's just getting oriented. And um, you can still kind of, you can still direct your, your hers questions uh, to me. And, and we'll be working with her to, to get her um, started on, on working with you guys on verification. Um, so I think that's the last slide on verification. I know this isn't a, a topic where there's probably a lot of specific questions, so I think I'll take a look at those. I think you can go on to the, the next slide. I think that's the last one for verification. Or do we have another question slide? Oh, just the events. Well, I'll take questions now, and I can tell you about some of the events that are coming up um, after that. Uh, so let me just look at the questions really quick. Okay, so I have a question about the CEPE um, for 2013, for 
for projects permitting under the 2013 code. So um, we plan on eventually switching over to the CEA. Kevin, can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, the eventual plan is that the CEA will replace the CEPE, but until enough people are certified uh, with the CEA certification, uh, we can't really make that switch. Um, so for the time being, the CEP is fine going forward. Uh, I, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, and then I forgot when I was talking, is that today is the last day to register for the exams for the CEA. Um, so if anyone forgot, uh, please register for that. Um, I think they're going to be offering a second round of exams in the new year. Um, so it, likely we won't do any, the CEP will be fine until they get enough people certified and I don't, I imagine that will be at least after the second round of CEA exams. That's not something that's going to happen right away and when it happens and when we have an exact plan we'll communicate that to everyone. Thanks, Kevin. And um, I've got another question about, um, well, this is about HERS mandatory requirements. You might want to add, but I'll, I'll take a stab at answering. Um, so are there any mandatory HERS requirements besides those mandated by the CEC? So we, um, we don't require additional mandatory HERS requirements, but we certainly encourage you to take measures, and they will, a lot of them will boost your compliance. So uh, it's, it's you confirm that, Kevin? <laughs> yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see other questions. So I think this is a question more specific to CMF and H, but um, communication. So just on the nature of communication between members of the project team. Um, so as we're delivering the raters. Um, as built uh, verification information to the Title 24 consultant to revise. Um, so we collect the energy measure summary from the reader, and the process has been that we will distribute that to the Title 24 consultant to revise. Um, and uh, for CMF and H, we actually offer an incentive to the to the Title 24 consultant to. Um, kind of offset some of the costs for uh, for managing that and taking care of that. So uh, the breakdown, and this is just for CMF and H, is um, a total of $50 per unit to the Title 24 consultant directly. And this is um, $15 per unit at enrollment and $35 per unit at completion. Um, so I'm certainly open to suggestions if if anyone wants to identify you know a way that we can make that process easier. But um, typically uh, we're we're expecting members of the project team to communicate internally, and um, uh, that's why we work with the registry to also kind of serve as an extra third party um, so that we can be unbiased in our in our implementation. Um, so uh, certainly follow up if, if you have ideas for you know how we can make it easier for you. Um, I know that certain aspects of working in the registry can be a little bit tricky, so um, we're we're open to making some updates. Um, okay, question. So Kevin, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head. Uh, question about incentive amounts. So I'll start this off by saying um, incentives can vary wildly by climate zone, um, but I guess so we're wondering what is the typical rebate um, uh, for a 3,000 square foot house. Do you feel comfortable answering that, Kevin? I don't know that I could say there's any typical. Um, if you get a cap score of 84, that gives you an incentive of $300, and then for every point below that you get an additional hundred dollars until you get to a score of 75 and then every point below that gives you two hundred dollars um, so it ranges from three hundred dollars if you got a score of 55 you'd be at I think it's fifty one hundred dollars um, I don't know that there's any typical home 
I think we had in some uh, previous presentation that we expected maybe a, a typical home to re, uh, earn a thousand dollar incentive, but again, that's just uh, based on some real loose averages, and it's really going to depend on the measures going into the home. Um, but uh, yeah, if anyone has a model and they want want to send it over and have us look at it and and see, uh, but I, as far as a typical incentive, I don't know that. I could give an accurate answer. Yeah, and at this point, you know, we're just starting to see 2013 code projects, so we'll be able to provide a more informative response to that sort of question after we've seen uh, more projects come in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. I don't see any other questions. Um, so feel free to, to shoot them in. I'm just going to go on to the, this slide that we're looking at right now on upcoming events. So I, I should have added, too, so we saw a lot of you at the KBEC conference this past weekend. That was really fun and nice to meet some of you in person. Um, uh, and we gave a few presentations, uh, one on uh, the big two, ducts and condition space, and high R-value walls, um, and then another one on incentive programs, which you guys know all about already. So, uh, But uh, if you're interested in learning more about uh, uh, specific, especially ducts and condition space, we're, we're actually developing um, modeling guidelines for those. And that's, that's actually Kevin and Megan are working on those, and, and I think Deborah too. Um, so those will be available hopefully sometime in November. Um, and then you can also keep your eyes out for a presentation we're going to do on uh, a webinar we're going to do on um, high R value walls sometime before the end of the year, maybe late November, early December. Um, and that's kind of, that's part of a series, kind of an ongoing series on um, more advanced and more um, uh, kind of interesting design features um, that we may see in the upcoming code. Um, and then also I want to present promote a uh, webinar that we're doing on November 5th. This is probably more for UCMF and H folks. Um, we have a, a gal from Stephen Winters Associates who's um, going to be presenting on Energy Stars Certified Multifamily High-Rise Program. So um, this, is, this is a program that's mostly relevant for high-rise projects. I think she'll also be going over um, the the offerings that are relevant for low-rise multifamily as well. Um, so you'll get this. This is actually a link, so I'm going to send out this slide deck um, in the next uh, couple days, so you'll be able to register for that if you if you're interested. Um, and you know, if there's other uh, if there's other presentations that you're interested in seeing um, from us, we really want to be able to support support you guys. So um, certainly send us suggestions. And I'll go to the, if you can go to the last slide, you'll see our contact information. Um, let's see. Looks like it's not advancing yet. Yep, there it is. So here's the email, info at cmfnh.com. You can address to any of us. So cmfnh, uh, I need to add Megan to this, but so it's Sophia Hartkoff and Scott Kessler, uh, and then myself, Shannon Todd. And this is an email. Um, this email actually goes to me, but I can address questions to anybody. Uh, and then Cap, uh, Matt Christie, Kevin, who's joined us today, Michelle and Deborah, and actually also Cheryl helps with planner review as well. Um, so you can email either of those emails if you have questions following up this this webinar. Um, and I know some of you asked a few kind of specific questions, or you know, if we didn't quite answer one of your questions on the air, you can follow up with us via email. Um, like I said, we'll be posting the recording and the slide deck uh, on our website and also sharing those with you in a follow-up email in the next couple days. Uh, I don't think I have any other questions, so uh, I guess we'll call it a day. Um, we really appreciate you taking your lunch to, to meet with us. Um, and I hope that it was uh, helpful for you guys, and, and um, we'll be seeing you, talking with you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye.